This past week, my family and I took, I took a few days off, and that's not something I do often, but we went to Glen Rose, Texas, to Dinosaur Valley State Park. Have anybody ever been there or ever heard of it? Some yeses, some noes. Well, there in Dinosaur Valley State Park, there are preserved some fossilized uh, footprints of dinosaurs who used to roam or walk down the riverbed. And if I remember correctly, don't quote me on this, but there were at one time some 156, is that correct? Uh, fossilized footprints in the riverbed. The weather was absolutely beautiful. Uh, we had a great outing, and I don't know if you can see on the TV, but the top picture there to the left, there is one of the footprints of the claw prints of the dinosaur, and the other picture is Bethany doing her best to try not to get wet, right? <laughs> she wanted to get in that water so bad. It was just a, actually just a beautiful day. Um, B dreams, Bethany dreams of being a paleontologist someday. Uh, this was about as an exciting of a trip as she could have gone on. And this is something that we wanted to do from the time that Kai was really young. But Bethany's learned something. She's been in the habit of collecting fossils for several years. And, and one of the things that she has learned is to be careful of replicas or fake fossils. She's learned to be careful when purchasing, to do the research, to understand is this an actual artifact or is this something that has been replicated? Because compromise and replicas are not the genuine artifacts. And that's kind of what we've been talking about as we move through Paul's letter to Colossians. One of the things that we see in this letter is the pressure for Christians there in Colossae to turn away or to substitute the gospel of Christ with something more. There were cultural uh, pressures that sought to add to the message of Christ. And in this letter, one of the things that Paul is doing is he's bringing the church back to a focus on Christ, back to a focus on Jesus that Christ is all-sufficient. The gospel does not need to be substituted. There does not need to be additions. Uh, Christ is all-sufficient. And Paul warns the church not to turn away and accept something other than the authentic message of Christ. Because anything other than the authentic message of Christ is a replica it's not something of value or great worth when we add to the message of Christ. So I want us to read our text together. We're going to begin in chapter 2. We're going to read through, uh, we're going to begin at verse 6 and we're going to read through verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, beginning with me at verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and not the ele and the elements, uh, elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. And having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of our sins, having canceled out the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, 
triumphing over them by the cross. Now, as always with Paul, there is a ton of stuff to unpack in these few paragraphs. But I want us today, for our time together, we're going to focus on just a couple of things. I want to focus on some pressures that Paul lists here that are tempting or trying to pull the church away from their focus on Christ. And two things that we see in the passage that we read, one of the things that are pressuring them are deceptive philosophies. So we'll talk about that. That's in chapter 2 and verse 8. The other thing that's pressuring them to turn from the authentic message of Christ is elements of the old law, circumcision, in verse 11. So notice with me, if you will, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition rather than the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. So here's the thing. Paul's saying, look, make sure that you don't get caught in this trap of following uh, these elementary principles of this philosophy. Now, we, we need to be careful because uh, for us, modern readers, we don't need to, to think here that Paul is speaking against the study, the discipline of philosophy. That's not what he's doing. He's not just saying, run away from philosophy. And I know in some of our history, we've had that opinion, that, that we just stay away from those things. But that's not necessarily, that's not what Paul is doing in our text. He's not saying stay away from philosophy, but there are elements, there are things being taught here in Colossae that Paul is warning the church against. And this is, I want to share with you a couple of things that, from a commentary by David Garland. And he notes this, the term philosophy had a broader meaning in the ancient world than it does in ours. It's not limited simply to Greek or Roman philosophy. It could also refer to all sorts of groups, tendencies, points of view, up to and including magical practices. So what I'm trying to share with you and what this particular individual is sharing in his commentary, philosophy was a much broader term in the ancient culture than it is in our day. And this could have also included the use in, uh, of magical practices. And so what Paul is doing here is he's contrasting this type of philosophy that was going on in Colossae with the message of Christ, with the gospel of of Christ. Notice that the gospel of Christ, this is going back to chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6, the gospel of Christ is the word of truth. But the philosophy that's being taught in Colossae, it's hollow and it's deceptive. Christ rescues and liberates. Chapter 1 and verse 13, but this type of philosophy runs the danger of pulling us back into darkness and captivity. So what Paul is doing here is he's contrasting this type of philosophy that was being taught and shared among the church that was tempting them to draw away and turn their attention from Christ. What Paul is doing is he's contrasting that type of philosophy with the truth and the authentic message of Christ. This type of philosophy was based on human traditions of the world. And although there's nothing wrong with tradition, Paul desires for the church to see and to know the glories that we have in Christ. Some of the things that Brother Craig was just talking about this morning at the Lord's table, Paul wants the church to see and to know the riches and the glory that we have in Christ. And compared with this philosophy, this philosophy falls very short of the glory that we have in Christ. Notice verses 9 and 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In Christ, you have been brought to 
fullness. There's nothing lacking. You don't need to substitute or add to the message. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness, and He is head over absolutely every power and authority. Christ is all-sufficient, and in Him we are not lacking. We do not need to substitute the gospel of Christ. And that's what Paul is sharing here to this church in Colossae. Now, one of the other things that's seeking to pull and draw their attention away from Christ is their identity, who they are. Notice here, uh, going back for a moment, as we, we begin to look at the second thing Paul talks about, which is elements of the, the old covenant. He's talking about circumcision. But, but they're challenged. Who are we in Christ? If we don't have the sign of this covenant, then maybe we're not fully participating in Christ. And in order to fully participate in Christ, some were teaching you needed to follow the signs of the old covenant, the sign that made you part of the community of God in, in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, I want to be very careful here. Because we have a tendency to, to dismiss the Old Testament from the New Testament. We have a tendency to see these as two different stories. And I want us to be careful because they're not two different stories. They're, they are the same story. And the story that begins in the Hebrew Scriptures in Genesis, it runs through the New Testament. It runs through Christ. It runs through to you and I today. So I want to be careful that we don't separate this into two stories because the Word of God is one continuous story. But here's the thing. Since the time of Abraham, and if you can reference Genesis 17 if you would like, circumcision, uh, at least for Israel, had been a sign of faithful obedience to God's covenant. We, uh, going back to Abraham, circumcision had been a symbol or a sign of faithful obedience to God's covenant, being in covenantal relationship with God. It was a marker of being God's chosen possession. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 15, as well as 1 Samuel 12 and verse 22. So it distinguished this particular group of people as God's elect, God's special chosen people, this mark of circumcision. But as you follow the story, and this is where I want us to really, you know, work hard to connect one story in our minds, as we follow the narrative of Scripture, God's promise and His blessing have flowed downstream like a river, if you can. Go back to that river we were looking at. This is what I was thinking of as I was looking at this. But God's promises from Abraham, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, all through this story of Scripture, they have flowed downstream through Israel, all the way through his promises of blessing. The currents flowed on every page, each narrative, every story. And this river has flowed through the pages of Scripture down to an ocean of abundance that's found in Christ. And here's the thing. Now in Christ, now in Jesus... It's not just one nation that's called out, but it's every nation. This river has flowed all the way down to the ocean of blessing that is Christ, and that is every nation can be found in Him. The prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, recorded this. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. He is above all. He is head of the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream into it. This has been the promise 
in the blessing of God from the very beginning that all nations would come to him. And those in Colossae, they're pressured to, to turn away. They're pressured to turn back upstream, if you will, not fully relying on the abundance of God. Notice Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11 and following. In him, that is in Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Here's your identity, church. Your identity is in Christ. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put to death when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You see what Paul is saying, church, your identity is in not what you do. Your identity is in Christ. Your identity is not in some physical mark on your flesh. Your identity is in Christ. Your identity is not in what you have accomplished, but your identity is what Christ has accomplished for you. And if we are going to turn back upstream and and, and pull away from the authentic message of Christ, we're placing our identity back in something other than the message and the hope and the glory of Christ that we now possess. And Paul's saying, don't forfeit it. Don't turn back upstream when you've come to see the ocean of abundance and blessing that you now stand before. Now's not the time to travel back upstream to the root, to the old way, because in Christ are abundant and new blessings. In Him, we have the forgiveness of our sins. We have new life where freedom is found and the barriers of division that existed are taken away. At the cross is where the river merges into the ocean of nations. And and if you could think about it in your head like this, God began back in the Hebrew scriptures with a call to one man. It's like a funnel. And from that man, Abraham was born a nation. And what was that nation's purpose? What were they there to do? They were to represent God. They were to be a nation, a kingdom of priests, his own special people, uh, to bless the other nations. And that funnel just keeps getting larger and larger. It's like the river that narrowly winds down to the ocean. And at the cross is where the river meets the ocean. And all is open and there in Christ. Every nation coming to God the Father through Messiah Jesus. It's where the blessings of Christ are. It's the marker cross in the Christ is a marker of an identity, not based in the old law, but in the new covenant community of Christ. And to turn back upstream would be to turn away from their and our new identity in Christ. These are the pressures that, that are pushing against the church at Colossae. They're pressures to accept some other teaching other than the authentic message of Christ. They're being pressured to accept going back upstream and returning back to things that they knew before time when God is saying, no, we're running to an ocean of blessing. We're running to my son, Jesus. And it's not time to go back upstream. That's not where we are now. And that's not who who identifies you now. It's not a mark or a cut in the flesh, but you're identified in Messiah Jesus, in Christ. That's where the river has been flowing from the very first page or very second page. That's where the river's been flowing. Now 
here we are in Christ. That's what they were dealing with. And maybe for us in our culture, we may sit back and think, well, I don't deal with philosophies of deception. I don't have to deal with that. Uh, circumcision is really not very much of a thing that I have to, to worry about today, uh, and at least not like in these terms. But how do we make this lesson, how do we take these principles that we find here about substituting the authentic message of Christ, how do we take these principles and apply them to ourselves today? Because here's the thing, the church was substituting or they were being tempted to substitute to the message of Christ, and they had become distracted. Their eyes, their mind had become off, had been pulled away from Christ and on other things. They had been pulled away from Christ and they were focused on circumcision. They had been pulled away from Christ and they were focused on this wisdom of philosophy that others were teaching, and they lost their focus on Christ. So how can we, in our day, take this lesson and apply it to us? here today. I'm glad you asked. I want to share that with you. Because here's the thing. As I was walking around Dinosaur State Park and enjoying the beautiful outing that we had, legs were tired, I was sore, uh, but it was a beautiful day. And we sit there and we studied the philosoph uh, the philosophies, the fossils, <laughs> We were studying those. We were taking pictures of them. We were going back inside and comparing maps and, and, and just trying to learn and absorb everything that had gone on there that we could see in a historic record. And as we drove out of the park, just a few miles up the road, on the left was a creation and evidence museum. And we knew of this museum, so we decided let's stop in there for a moment. And here's the thing. We pulled into the Creation and Evidence Museum and we saw different things in there. There was a different story being told than some of the, the story that we had read in the park. And it got me to thinking, maybe we don't deal so much with, with circumcision or not being circumcised today but do we allow our minds to become distracted by other things? Do we allow our eyes to be shifted away from the message of Christ? You know, today, one of the things that many Christians are involved with is this debate over creation or evolution. And don't hear me wrong, I'm not saying the conversation is not important. I'm not saying it's, it's not a good conversation to have but it consumes the minds of a lot of people. And the creationists, I don't know where I am on my, my notes, but we're just gonna go for it here. Uh, the creationists, they may tell you, well, you know what? You just have to believe that the six days of creation, they're literal 24 hour days. And if you don't believe in those six days of creation as being literal 24 hour days, then you don't believe the scripture. And then the evolution on the other side, evolutionists on the other side might be saying, well, you Christians, you just don't believe in solid science. You don't believe in what the, the science shows. And so the debate goes back and forth and the conversations go round and round. But as I sat there, as I, I traveled from one location just a couple of miles up the road to the next location, and I was trying to take in as much as I could, you know what I noticed, and this is not a critique of any one thing or any one person, but just to me, what I noticed was, where's Jesus? We've got a lot of science over here. We've got a lot of science over here, and we've got these debates just going and going and going, but the gospel's missing. Not one plaque. Anything about Christ and the gospel. You see, maybe it's, it's not that we're challenged by circumcision today, but there are other things that can pull our attention, can pull our sight away from the authentic message of Christ. I'm not saying, again, please don't hear me wrong, that the debates are not good. 
I'm not saying that the study of science, I, I love the study of science. I love learning more about our world and our creation. I'm not trying to say that's bad or anything like that. I'm just trying to say in this conversation, where's Jesus? Where's the gospel? Because here's the thing, no matter whose science you may believe, newsflash, they're both making assumptions. It's just a matter of whose science you choose to believe for yourself. And I'm not here to tell you which way to believe. All I want to do is say, where's Jesus in this conversation? And have we been pulled away and distracted on something other than Christ? Has our focus shifted? That's just one example we could use, right? I mean, we're in a political season right now. Here you go. We're talking about religion, politics, and science. I'm, I'm truly going to get in trouble for this, right? But we could use politics as another example, just as easy. My side stands for justice. My side stands for truth. My side, my side has the truth. Guess what? Both sides are making the same claims. And we can get so fixated on that as Christians that we're fighting for one side over the other, but guess what? Who's missing in the conversation? Jesus. Again, Jesus is missing in the conversation. See, in our minds we think, oh, we're so much above the first century. <laughs> Those silly people... Uh, they're getting tripped up over circumcision. We would never do something like that, would we? But there are things that pull our attention, our minds, our eyes, our focus away from Christ. And our challenge today, as we, as we take Paul's little letter and we try to make it fit to our lives, our challenge is really, what's pulling me away from Christ? What's pulling my attention away from the authentic message of Christ? Because we cannot substitute Christ in the message of the gospel for anything. It can't be added to. It can't be substituted. Because if it is, it's not authentic. And it's of little value if it's not authentic. So here's the question I'm going to leave us with today. And that's simply this. I don't know what may be pulling your focus away from Christ, or even if your focus is pulled away from Christ. But I bet during this challenging season and time that we live in, something is trying to divert your attention from Christ. I would challenge us, what's shifting my focus today from Jesus and the message of the gospel?